thank you all for coming and uh, those of you who have invested in us thank you from uh, my heart on behalf of the team too we really appreciate it and actually your money has helped us uh, take this much further than uh, we could have done without your help thank you once again uh, for those of you who uh, don't know us um, what we're going to do today is I will take you through the um, uh, commercialization of an innovative technology for the production of plastics. That's what we're doing. Uh, and actually I have been asked to give you a glimpse at uh, a bit more than just a dry status of the company. And that's exactly what I intend to do. We'll talk about uh, uh, the difficulties we're facing, the challenges, uh, what we do to overcome those challenges and also where do we stand today. Speaking of plastics, let's talk first about the industry. It's a huge market exceeding one trillion dollars uh, annual revenue and we're focusing on uh, a specific part of the market which is the injection molding. This is the method via which roughly 50 percent of the plastic parts in the world are being made. For those who are not familiar, um, injection molding involves a mold, which basically is two slabs of uh, metal carved in a way that when sandwiched together, they form cavity, a cavity that corresponds to the shape of the plastic part we want to make. What do we do with this? Well, we put it in an injection molding machine, the mold, which uh, then we feed with uh, plastic granules and the injection molding machine is melting those granules and injects them in, uh, at, at a high pressure into the mold cavity while at the same time holding the two parts of the mold together. So that's the method. It's an old story, it's nothing new, but it comes with certain benefits and a lot of restrictions and challenges. One of the major challenges of this method is flow. Basically what we need to do is to fill the cavity while the plastic material is still liquid and we try to fill it before it starts to solidify. Because when it gets solid it blocks the way into the cavities of the, uh, the cavity of the mold and that's bad for the plastic part. It cannot be fully formed. The way we are dealing with this today is by brute force. Basically we're injecting the liquid resin, the liquid plastic with a very high pressure into the cavity and uh, pressure means in this case speed. So as fast as we can before it starts to solidify, which also requires a very high clamping force to keep those two parts together. Um, so that's a major issue, easing flow in the cavity. And the industry has been trying to solve this in many different ways. Uh, there are ways that have been applied thus far, uh, but they, they all look only into filling the cavity, nothing else. There is no other benefit, basically. And even the, the ways that uh, we have today to ease flow beyond just brute force are working somewhat. In some applications, others they don't work, and in most cases, they make the whole process much more expensive. And here we come with uh, an innovative and very simple solution. For the first time we have managed to heat up an entire mold while we're injecting, which keeps the liquid plastic liquid flowing in the mold and then rapidly cool it down when the injection stops to allow the part to form in the mold. We achieve that by two different means. 
One is a new mold design that is based on a aluminum, aluminum uh, instead of steel, which is what the traditional conventional molds are made of. And a maze, a labyrinth of channels on the back of the mold. And that's one element. And the other element is an integrated heating and cooling unit which is basically tempering the entire mold by circulating, by sending uh, a fluid, a tempering fluid, through the channels of the mold, hot while we're injecting, cold after the injection to let the part form. We have patents for both the method and the mold design. Uh, but frankly, although the method patent seems more impressive. Uh, the key here is the mold. Anyone could make a heater and a cooler, which is what this unit is. But no heater and cooler would ever work without this particular mold design. That's what we have done. Of course, since the 90s, we are flooded by products that are nice to have, inventions, new ideas and all that. But the question is always, do they really uh, solve a real problem? Do they bring real benefits to the customers? Oh, hell, they do in this case. We're actually delivering an unmatched cost per part, and cost per part, per plastic part, is the king of the hill in this industry. That's what everybody is looking for. How do we achieve this? First of all, we, uh, by reducing substantially the uh, uh, I pressure, we also reduce substantially the clamping force that is needed. The, the, the force that keeps the two parts of the mold together. They don't need anymore that high clamping force because we are injecting uh, uh, at a very low pressure. And that allows us to um, mold the same size of parts with much smaller injection molding machines. That can be a savings from tens of thousands up to millions, depending on the size of the injection molding machine. To mold a tiny thing like this, you would probably need an injection molding machine that has a clamping force of two or three hundred tons, just to give you an idea of what, what we're talking about. So if you can uh, mold something bigger that would require, let's say, two thousand tons and take it down to five hundred tons, that's a difference in the millions. So one big advantage and realistic when we're saying here up to 50 percent, it's usually 40 to 50 to 60 percent. And when you go to those very large injection molding machines, it can be even 80 percent savings. So that's one parameter. The other one is more than one third of the plastic parts in the world are being made thicker than their mechanical uh, requirements would uh, dictate. Why is that? Because the thinner the walls are, the more difficult it is to fill this thin part of the cavity before the plastic gets solid. Because basically the hot liquid plastic gets overwhelmed by the massive amount of metal around it. So thinner walls were, were, was a no. Now we can mold with this technology up to film thin literally film. And uh, that addresses the biggest cost factor of a plastic part, which is resin. Being able to mold much thinner means we use much less resin. And that's 50% in average of the total cost per part. Um, we can, uh, realistically speaking, we can, uh, customers are willing to mold uh, 30 to 40 percent 
thinner walls. We can go up to 75, 80, 90 percent, but realistically, is uh, we're looking into the region of let's say 25 to 40 percent less. But if you apply that to the 50 percent of the total cost, you're talking about a total saving per part in the region of 15 to 20 or even more percent. Now we're talking about a fully commoditized industry that uh, is doing investments and inventing things and they're putting a lot of uh, intellectual and capital effort into gaining 0.5 percent. And that for most businesses with a conventional technology is a difference between make or break. And there they have this kind of savings which are really unbelievable at first sight. The third parameter is that we are now able to mold different shapes in a single mold, which means, I mean, take for example Scania, customer we are very active now with. Building a truck requires something like four to five thousand plastic parts. That's four to five thousand molds. And basically, if you mold one part in uh, uh, a separate mold on a separate machine, it would require four to five thousand machine time units to mold all these parts. If you can squeeze four or five or six of those parts in one mold, suddenly you don't need five thousand molds, you need one thousand molds or even less which is a substantial um, uh, capital expenditure saving. Also, you don't need um, 5,000 machines in as a, the aggregate of time. Uh, you need one-fifth of, of, of that time. And that means one-fifth of the energy, one-fifth of the man-hours. Uh, if you talk to industry, uh, experts, they will tell you, well, yeah, we have always been doing that. We have always been molding multiple parts. Sure. But the process with a conventional technology is quite uh, unstable. It's difficult to get it right. You can do it. But the truth is that only a small fraction of today's molding are uh, is being is getting molded with multiple shapes in the same mold it's a very small percentage of the total jobs because it's difficult to get it right with the gates the high pressure it requires a level of parameterization on the injection molding machine and very careful design and uh, even even like this it's not always possible to uh, maintain the level of repeatability that is required. So yes, it is possible, but the difference we make is that we make it as easy as anything else. You can do it just as you would mold every other part, be it single cavity or multiple cavities. There's no uh, there's repeatability, 100%. There's no special design required. You just do it. And obviously that increases yield and further reduces uh, cost. Last but not least, uh, it's uh, due to the much uh, smaller tensions developed w during the injection because of the lower pressure. I will put it very simplistically, it's not very accurate, but it will give you the idea. There are many le much less tension baked into the part during the injection stage, which means that you don't see all this, um, or you see very little of it, uh, in most cases nothing, uh, like the rainbow effect or the anomalies on the surface, the welding lines, which is where the flow from two different ends of the part are meeting. Uh, there is much less warping as well. Uh, and uh, but, but this is really uh, what has people have been trying to achieve and to some extent have been achieving with the other methods as well. We take it a step further, but this is not really the difference we make. The difference we make is that we do all that and at the same time 
we uh, can reduce substantially the cost per part. So we have solved a problem that people have been trying to solve for a long time. And uh, well, are we rich yet? If we have solved that big problem, well, I'll paraphrase here General von Moltke, who said in the beginning of World War One, what he said. In our case, I would say, no business plan survives first contact with the market. Nothing can be done just like this because it's a nice product. It uh, it delivers the goods. Okay. That's a nice starting point. And trust me, our business plan has changed about a hundred times. Next year, we meet here. And I'm going to tell you about the change that will have happened from now till next year. For now, I'm going to tell you about the challenges we have, challenges we have faced and how we dealt with those. On a side note, what we're trying in the company is to there's a spirit of making mistakes, admitting those mistakes, trying to find ways to correct them. So we're all allowed to make mistakes, because I'm seeing throughout my career, which is a series of um, uh, startups, that people are putting too much effort in defending their wrong choices, and that's something we shouldn't be doing. We should be very swift in recognizing what we're doing wrong or what hasn't worked. Um, because at the end of the day, we're not being judged by uh, whether we made a mistake or not, but whether we succeeded uh, to take this venture to where we want it. So uh, it's a story of constant change. So we built this beautiful thing. Who's the customer? Because you make a new thing, there must be a customer, right? Well. Forget everything you see, focus on this orange circle there. So, this is the guy, yeah? is a production contractor, because, for example, Volvo doesn't, doesn't produce in-house most of the parts. Scania produces nothing in-house. They uh, subcontract the production of plastic parts to, to, um, to other uh, manufacturers or to other plants. So that's our, our guy, isn't he? This is the actual buyer because this is where the production is happening. This is where our machine is going to find its place. Yeah, well, let's try to see the benefits we provide. How do they relate with the interests but also the decision making uh, ability of the different players in the ecosystem? So the production contractor is obviously interested in capital expenditure. They want to buy less expensive machinery, and we can give them that. Nobody is going to ask him, why are you making this part on our behalf with a cheaper injection molding machine? They don't care about that. As long as it is in spec and everything, that's fine. So this is a parameter that our natural customer has a total say on. He can decide on his own. CAPEX comes from the machinery, but also the mold cost. And our molds are much cheaper, usually, than the conventional ones, because they are much lighter, much smaller. One-tenth of the weight, and smaller size, and much easier to make. But that, he does not, he cannot decide upon that. We'll see why. So that's one thing he can decide upon, if it was just a matter of buying our technology for reducing capital expenditure, they would do it. But that limits a lot the uh, applications that uh, can be attractive uh, for, for this technology, because there are many other benefits that we're providing. So what happens there? Let's look, take a look at the margin, cost per part, the king of the industry. Well, that depends on resin, for example, how much plastic material you use, right? But that comes from the product owner. The molder has no influence on that. Because Volvo will tell them, 
this plastic cage for the mirror, what exactly it will be designed, what the thickness, how it is going to be made. They will only execute the order. So in this case, the, this guy cannot decide uh, for our technology on something that is of <laughs> huge interest to them because they cannot influence it. Wall thickness is defined by the product owner. Yield, which is how many parts can we squeeze in a, uh, in a single mold. Well, that might look like it's a decision that belongs there, but it doesn't because the product owner owns the mold. Even if the molder is buying the mold, it buys it for them. So they also devise the specifications of the mold. And if Volvo has decided, because they didn't know that this existed, that the conventional technology is too tricky to, to, mo to mold multiple different parts in one mold, their guidelines are, we don't do that. Or we do it only under approval, in very specific cases. So, gone is that too. He cannot decide for that. And, uh, well, man hours depend on the previous. So, what we see here, and, mm, well, it's not just that. There are also other parties involved. There are, in many cases, third parties, like external designers, consultants involved. They have their own opinions. Plus the mold maker. He's buying nothing, but he makes the molds. And sometimes this is the guy who's the king of the hill. Because the mold making defines the output. So everybody works with the mold makers. And they have their own opinions too. Oh, aluminum molds. Oh, that wouldn't last. Four cavities in one mold. Yeah, well, that's too tricky. We don't need it for this application. Of course, it's not very difficult to convince them, but you need to work on them. So what do we have here? One natural customer. Th this is our customer, really. And a decision-making process spread across the ecosystem. How do you tackle this? We have tried several different ways. At the end, when we started in the pre-launch phase, what we did is we did paid trials with industry leaders. It was good that we managed to get them to pay, but we wouldn't do them otherwise because it would not indicate enough interest from them. And there, we did not only do that for endorsement, but also for silent joint development. One lesson we have learned, uh, not with this startup, but with many others, is that it doesn't matter what you think about the qualities of your product. What matters is what the customer thinks. So that was for us an opportunity not only to get their endorsement of big names, but also to uh, improve our product, our technology, the way we package it, the way we fine-tune it, so it really meets the customer expectations. And uh, that, But that was pre-launch. The key question about the customer is, is more important to be answered during launch, which has been happening the last few months, and beyond. What do we do there? Well, fierce segmentation, sales segmentation, not marketing segmentation. Basically, we, are, we don't even talk to molders who are our natural customer, who is the paying customer. We don't even talk to them because it makes no sense. We go straight to product owners. We go to Volvo, to Scania, to Whirlpool. And that's our number one target. Second target are molders, production subcontractors, but only if they work jointly with a product owner for specific parts. And that is the case quite often, especially in the automotive industry, where uh, Volvo might tell the, those dear one suppliers, as they call them, that, uh, okay, I have this mirror and here's the design of the uh, uh, front part of the car, of the cabin. Uh, now, 
you can develop for me a few ideas and then mold them too. And in this case, uh, the molder works hand in hand with the product owner. And this case is of interest to us. Actually, we took it a step further with Scania. We tried this for the first time with Scania. Uh, and that's part of the continuously changing process, sales process. We um, actually put them together, put Scania and one of their molders together, targeting specific parts, looking at them as a joint account for us. And that has worked. In any other case, we would be lost in endless negotiation with the molder, who would be promising lots of things, lots of good things. And then they would never go back to Scania. And if they did, they would never be able to promote what we're doing the same way we do. And we have seen this scenario uh, in reality. I, 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 I'm speaking of experience. So basically, uh, Fear segmentation is what we're doing, and for the mold makers, we just educate them. They will never buy anything from us, but it, it's important to address them uh, with the same uh, diligence as uh, our regular customers, because they are part of the equation. So that's what, what we're doing, and it works. Yes, I know. Let's move on quickly. Let's look at the sales process. Orange dots are decision-making points. What is different here to speed it up? Because it, it may look like a typical sales process, more or less for an industrial product. A lesson we have learned is that we need to select carefully the parts and we need to be involved ourselves in this. We can't let, it, uh, we can't let our, the product owners or the molders decide for it because it is very likely that they will decide for parts that are not taking full advantage of what we offer. And that would make our offering less uh, appealing. So that's one difference from the typical processes. And then there's another thing here, which is uh, part of the challenge of the sales process. And I'll explain in the next, on the next slide why. Uh, the industry is always doing a production sampling, a production trial. That is not related to us. They always do that. Before they make a new part, they will do trials and make sure that they have designed it properly and it comes out nicely and according to the specifications. Why is this a problem? Well, the whole sales cycle is a challenge and the challenge is time. We were expecting in the beginning, in our initial plan, a longer period for the first decision. It didn't happen. Actually, the first decision is coming very quickly. And that was quite interesting. But then we were expecting a much faster uh, progress with the next steps. And that isn't happening. Because they do production sampling, the production trial, and actually, there, our work is three days. That's it. But for those three days, we wait two and three months. The main uh, time-consuming part is getting the test mold from the mold makers. They are all fully booked these days. I don't know why. The industry is going really well, despite what you're hearing. Workshops are fully booked, and it's very difficult to get anything from a mold maker these days quicker than two or two and a half or three months. And then they make the final decision. And then another nightmare begins. What is that? It's the production planning. So you got the order, right? And when do I deliver? When do I get my money? <laughs> well, it depends. It could be three months, it could be five, it could be eight or nine. And that's a part we cannot influence at all. The reason is because, for example, the product owner has uh, have their own plans about um, timing. Volvo will launch uh, the car when they want to launch it. And they will be planning long ahead before that. They will make decisions long ahead. We may have booked the sale, but we have not really sold anything physically yet. We have secured it. When are we going to invoice them? Well, that depends. And there are many other parameters and constraints that are 
playing a big role here. And we've explored various different ideas. At the end of the day, it all boils down to continuously putting in an effort to grow the pipeline because that's what's going to bring a normalized uh, inflow of business at the end of the day. There's nothing you can do about it. And uh, this is the challenges we have faced. Uh, let's see where we stand today. On the commercialization, I'm happy to say that most trials converted to sales with leading customers. And that's a big achievement. Um, the first systems have already been delivered, as we speak, um, with uh, Whirlpool, Plaston, Chimplasta, all of them significant industries, opinion leaders, and that's exactly what we wanted. It takes longer to get those guys in, but there is a multiplier effect, and we wanted that. Our pipeline is growing constantly. Uh, we're putting in a lot of effort in this. Uh, our series production has been set up, which means we not only are able to sell now, but we can actually deliver too. <laughs> An often overlooked uh, step. Um, and we are uh, intensifying our commercial efforts toward fattening our pipeline, populating it, uh, because that is what is going to bring the normalized inflow of business by not only doing more work directly, but also by expanding markets into new markets, geographically speaking, and new channels. So, that's what has happened until now. Overall, we are quite uh, pleased uh, with uh, the progress. Uh, there are challenges. To, uh, that we need to deal with. There will be even more that we don't know of right now. But um, I think what, what we have gained as a team is the ability to see it, admit it, react quickly, and most of the time actually be more proactive than reactive with those challenges. Thank you very much for those 30 minutes of your time.